So I can't really point to, you know, like the book that would be brandished in, you know, a pride parade saying this is the book. Um, but the, the material is there throughout. And, uh, and some of it's super troubled. I mean, I, I don't want to get off into the science fiction thing. This is supposed to be about fantasy, but, uh, you know, the forever war is, is certainly a discussable book in this regard. I don't think it comes out very, uh, admirable in the end about the topic of uh, homosexuality, but it is at least discussable in, in, in the, the idea of somebody like grappling their head, you know, against it. And also the fact that the character is heterosexual, but is considered queer, you know, in, in the future. And so there is some degree of kind of wondering if that's the right word, you know, who are we, where am I, what is this about really? Um, let's go to the fantasy of the eighties. And there is a, a tendency, uh, to write the male heroes, um, with a few interesting exceptions, but there is a tendency to write the male heroes as, uh, as, as <laughs> you might want to say bearded queer, right? They, they are, claims to be heterosexual there is sort of a notion that they have uh you know some kind of sexual relations with women um they on the other hand if you actually look at the stories and the interactions they're intimate and emotional and dependent and highly consequential relations are very much with young good-looking men just like them um, and the female characters are often doll-like, um, often even figures of fun. I mean, they're, they're treated quite, they're, they're thought of as quite badly. They're stupid, for example. Um, and then the ones that are like the big love interest are super abstract and there's never actually any genuine interaction, you know, except for this ineffable attraction, but there's no actual thing that, you know, I mean, when, when two characters, you know, get with it in, in, in Tanith Lee, they want to. Um, in the books I'm thinking about, you know, that you get the idea that the author's kind of like, um, yeah, and it's it's like true love, you see? Right. So the the books, I mean, I'm thinking actually of uh, the Dorini books by Catherine Kurtz, um, which strike me as extraordinarily queer, but they don't, you know, of course they're not. I mean, look, I mean, he's in love with her. And, you know, that guy's going to get married. You're like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so the the heterosexual interactions are deeply unconvincing. So there's there's closeted queer fiction, um, and I really think it's very much an '80s thing. And then there's one that's really interesting. The books by Heather Gladney, uh, beginning with Teok's War. Um, the the overriding relationship through the books is well, there's the Two sword wielding ninja outlaw, everyone hates him, troubled young, you know, assassin. Or okay, um, this guy, of course, becomes the buddy of the large, blonde, decent, you know, slightly, slightly confused, you know, not can't really seem to get it together about Mary, which, you know, marrying that other, you know, King's daughter, that seems all troubled in some way. And then his knowing sister who, you know, tells our hero, you know, he, he relies on you, you know, he needs you. And the two of them have like tumbling wrestling matches and, you know, it's, it's, it's all, but they don't, they don't actually have sex in, you know, the story. Or if they do, it's never mentioned or referred to as if it were a reality. And the, the story proceeds through all sorts of other things. But this is the core. But it's like the author just can't spit it out. Um, even though, I mean, you're reading it and you're kind of like, ooh, ooh, you know, that's quite a wrestling match, my friends. And so... Um, the next step moves over to uh, The Winged Assassin and the series of books um, that go with that. And that's just like, okay, now we're going to step over the line. Now we've got a pansexual um, 
character who's very similarly is, you know, young and assassin, you know, ninja like, uh, hated by everybody, uh, you know, whatever. But anyway, same kind of guy. But it's so it's a I mean, the, the books are written. I don't know if they're totally contemporary, the the the, um, the Gladney books and then this series, um, but they're really, really close. And so in those, you have uh, a much more explicit deal. The, the main character is good with sex with anybody, but prefers men and um, him, him, him being male. And it's treated as a given and different people in the culture of the book, you know, like it or dislike it or tolerate it because he's like with the, you know, the general or the, or with the, the emperor or something, but, um, and everybody has an opinion. So this is much more, okay, this is the character and these are the circumstances he faces. These are his preferences and this is what comes of it. And, um, and that actually is sort of the most grounded of these. It's like, all right, we are talking about this. And guess what? These characters are interesting people. This is a cool book. Um, I'm actually a little, and in the rereadings, I found actually this series, you know, considerably more compelling than many of the others that fell into that zone. Oh, and that reminds me of the interesting, we really shouldn't leave um, the, the sex positive heterosexual stuff which interestingly enough is more new-ish. Um, there, there's sort of that 50s and 60s period where everybody's, it's, it's a baby boomer thing. I think they're all like wigged out about sex, right? It, it can't ever be, you know, like good. And then that moves actually into about the mid 70s and then, then people start liking it again. And so a bunch of fantasy fiction in the 80s featured female protagonists who were in fact uh, sexually active with men and it was no big deal. It's kind of fun. It's, it's, uh, there, there's the ones who, you know, start off all like choked up and troubled and, you know, have sort of almost an asexual quality. And then they kind of very slowly grade into this and there's some like that, but I'm thinking of like the, you know, the hey babe you know kind of female protagonist like thorn in uh the frost flower and thorn books um who who yeah you know she's a, she's a badass you know killer killer sword babe and you know when she feels like having a lay she gets one and it's fun and that's that and then there's the couple in um uh the wind sing the wind singers the uh harpy's flight um yeah so in, in those, uh, we have the two characters who are a couple, and it's kind of not a big deal. In fact, we don't really even see them like, you know, in bed or the, their sexual life together is more or less off screen, but it is there because, you know, they're, they're two adult humans who travel together as a couple. And the whole thing is kind of a shrug, you know, yeah. You know, we're together and that it's never like threatened. It's in the sense of, you know, a third party um, and the, the notion that either of them has any issue about it is absent. They like each other. They go to we travel. To, we're not like, you know, a weird, no explanation buddy duo. We're, you know, we're lovers and everybody sees them as such. And no big deal. So. There's an array across these that is well worth understanding as an array instead of just saying, okay, well, here's the queer one. There's more in common with sort of the sex positive same sex stories with the sex positive heterosex stories. There's more in common between those than there is with like sort of a het block and a gay block. So I'm not sure if I've really named enough uh, to be interesting to you or if any of them really qualify as, you know, kind of the take home, you know, feel good. Yeah, this this is the, the you know, the, the, the this is kind of the banner book. You know, I, I don't think I've got one of those. 
Um, but as an array of people grappling with this through the generational changes of the 70s and 80s, um, and then looking back on some of the earlier stuff and recognizing that the writers were not in any way unaware of you know, the, the issues. Um, well, that's what I got. And I'll, as I say, I'll probably face palm and say, I should have said so and so, you know, but stand by, I guess, for that. Last one. Christopher asks, uh, do I remember correctly that you had a short write up of some game in the works on the old Adept Press website based on the shadow of yesterday? Yes, I did. Um, did something ever come out of that? Well, at last pass, um, which would have been sometime in 2018, um, I had brought that about to the point where I realized that I didn't really want to continue much with it. Um, and I posted about it at the Patreon at that time. So there's this ancient, ancient post. By the way, finding things in the Patreon, it's kind of brute. They, they don't really set it up in any archival way. Um, I think you can find it with Shadow of Yesterday in the search function um, in whatever tier it's at. I mean, the tiers have also changed, you know, at least a couple of times. So who knows what, how accessible it is. I will include the materials and maybe some of the text for that post in this one so you can see what I wrote back then. Um, it was, interestingly enough, uh, had sort of this, is it science fiction, is it fantasy? Well, it's both uh, set up for it. Um, I really liked what I came up with in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, particularly these different sects of swords fighting cultists or militias. Um, and it perhaps as a setting was a little overly clever with its sort of political analogies. And ultimately, uh, and I liked a lot of the ideas, the idea of the beautiful monsters. There's a little bit of the Tanith Lee effect in there too. But... No, nothing came out of it in the sense of me saying, look, I'm going to develop this further. I'm going to like make this into a much more playable text. And that sense that I had with Circle of Hands that I actually wrote about in the later chapters of when you knew this must be done. I didn't have that. I think I was working out a lot of interesting ideas and I was also working out how I was going to relate to the shadow of yesterday in terms of its playability and uh, difficulties that I and others had experienced with it and things that were claimed about it that I wasn't sure were actually borne out. Um, so I was kind of like really grappling with it, sort of the, the design, if that's the right word, and the play of this thing helping me really get into the guts of, of aspects of that system um, and discovering as I went uh, aspects that I didn't think were really going to fly which is too bad because I did like my array of secrets and keys to the extent that I kind of want to look over them and say, you know, was I onto something here? And I just need a different systemic approach, you know, for, for this to be realized as, as fun play. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it'll be up to you to check it out. I mean, I've got that material available for you here now. And uh, suffice to say that it's a good example of enjoying myself with some design, with some writing, with some conceptualizing, with some play, and in particular the play stopping me short and saying, okay, you don't actually have the meat of play here. You have a lot of good writing ideas, but you don't have, you know, this, this, you are not, this is not operating off of play and it's, it, you're not getting anywhere when you play it. So that's where I got. My thoughts on The Shadow of Yesterday today, because Christopher asks that, what are your thoughts on The Shadow of Yesterday today? Um, well, as with so many things at that time, I think it was rushed into publication. I think that it was uh, in a euphoric and actually uncritical state. Um relative to what everybody was enthusiastically telling each other 
particularly in the context of the Pacific Northwest in the mid 2000s and proceeding into the events of the next five or six years, um, people were blowing a lot of sunshine around. And there was a, a confusion between entrepreneurial profit and uh, personal you know, vision and uh, popularity. Um, and the confusions among those, I would have said it would have included play, except that play was dropped. And that uh, many of them could not even properly be said to be designed. Not in my sense of practicing role players developing their instrumentation. And the shadow of yesterday, I think, was at the juncture of functionality between a play-oriented, you know, design as a by-blow of, of fun play and maybe a cool idea, and then you can try that in play and then keep riding out from there to see what we need so that this thing is generally playable to the idea of uh, what in science we used to call, or I think it's still called, the minimum publishable units. The idea that, uh, and, and that how much do you need to call it, you know, a role-playing game and have your name on it and be a publisher, spit that out as quickly as possible and spit out more of them as quickly as possible. Um, and then you'll, you know, now you're a real, you know, now you're a real dude. Um, the transition into thinking like that uh, went much further into, I think, a very uh, unadmirable zone in that culture and place among others. And the shadow of yesterday, I think, shows its roots, the beginning of its creation in the, the more positive side of that, and then sort of hits a wall and falls into the, you know, the, the unadmirable side, or at least doesn't manage to get where it may well have been able to go um, through further design, through more critical views of its various parts and get out of that euphoria of pumping it out for Gen Con. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at with it. I mean, I look at it and I say, you know, that is something that was in the middle of what looked like a lot of really fruitful development. And if Clinton had played the hell out of it and not been addled, you know, by everybody kissing his ass and petting him and telling him that, you know, he was a real publisher, um, that, I mean, whatever that means. Because Clinton really did have his head on straight about that stuff um, when we were working on The Forge together. And I think there was some sort of subversion at that point. And the game sort of shows its, uh, you know, its historical position at stopping short right when the real work could well have been done. Well... That's it. Super, super long. Lots of monologuing. Um, with any luck, some interest may be found, can be had in the midst of mostly, you know, cranking and uh, you know, even some finger pointing and um, some sense of, uh, you know, bitter old crank. Cranks on. Um, let me know the good that you have seen, if any. And let's work on that. Thanks again to everybody. Looking forward to all the discussion.